Throws it back and scores! Brady Leibold goes back and forth behind the net, comes out the right side and lifts the backhander up and in. Leibold right here on Dylan. Dylan comes back with the right of his own. Here's Leibold uppercut. Another right by Leibold. Coming out another fight, Brady Leibold got the right hand pumping on Tony Mann up and over top and trying to control him as Leibold got that jackhead right going. Throwing a lot off the helmet. Now Cody Mann answering, but Leibold switched to left and he got a few more in there. Oh, you gotta be loving this if you're at the Civic Center. Welcome back to another edition of Hockey to Heroin, The Road to Recovery. This is episode number 10. I cannot believe where I'm already 10 episodes in. It's really been incredible. It's been a really, really exciting week. I have some great news. I've signed on to the Hockey Podcast Network. They are responsible for producing Tales with TR, Terry Ryan's podcast. They also have 31 podcasts, one for each team in uh, each city for the NHL, guys. Uh, top quality podcasts. They also have a few other uh, podcasts, uh, Ice Analytics and a couple other ones with females uh, talking other things in hockey. Uh, guys, check them out. Follow them at Twitter, uh, at Hockey Podnet. Uh, really excited to announce a partnership with them. Um, really looking forward to working with them, guys. So please follow them on Twitter. Uh, once again, guys, this episode is proudly brought to you by Team Issued Limited. Team Issued is connecting all walks of life. Team Issue does this by recreating that special feeling of being part of something bigger, a community for all striving towards the same goal. Guys, take a minute right now, pause this, head over to www.teamissue.ca. Check out the clothing. Check out their hats. It's sick. This is my former teammate, Jesse Paradise, a WHL alumni, Kelowna Rocket, um, University of Manitoba graduate. Uh, guys, this clothing is actually so sick and top quality. Use promo code TOEDRAG15 to get 15% off your total purchases. Uh, it's been a big week. Uh, as you guys know, uh, I'm building a studio out of an old chicken coop here on my girlfriend Taylor's parents' property. Uh, it's a work in progress. Um, a guy by the name of Matt Thompson sent me $150 last week. Um, I bought some insulation, uh, some vapor barrier, and then my girlfriend pitched in the rest of the money for the insulation and uh, the drywall. Um, uh, Matt uh, shared a story with me. He had a friend named Matt Lajinski, who is a fellow hockey player, a second-round pick of the Sault Ste. Marie Greyhounds. And uh, Matt, unfortunately, lost his battle with addiction a few years ago. Uh, I didn't know Matt uh, personally, but uh, through his friend Matt Thompson, he shared this story. And uh, I thought it would be appropriate uh, if we named this studio after Matt Lajinski. So um, this is the inaugural episode. Even though the studio is unfinished, I'm sitting in here right now. Uh, there's no drywall up, nothing. It's just uh, insulation and vapor barrier. There's no lights or anything, but there's sunlight coming through the window, so I'm all good. But this is the inaugural episode, so I'm proud and honored to announce that I'm uh, recording in the Matt Lajinski studio for the very first time. Uh, guys, Tuesday morning, first thing, check out www.sportsnet.ca Big Reads. Gare Joyce has uh, written a piece on my life, my story. Uh, I didn't hold back. No bullshit, no lies. Um, there might be some things in there that you know, might paint a pretty bad picture of me or whatever, but this is the truth. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, I'm changing my life and I'm doing better things now and I'm on the right track. So, um, hopefully nobody can judges me too bad for it. And at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter because I know that what I'm doing is for the greater good right now. And that, uh, hopefully I'm going to help just one person. Ultimately, that's my goal. Um, some more exciting news. I'm going to have Sheldon Kennedy on as my next guest. Uh, obviously he went through a, a horrible time in swift current, uh, long before I played there, but, um, you know, I'm really excited to have him to join the Hockey to Heroin family tomorrow. Um, but without further ado, let's get into this episode. I'm really excited to have this guy on. I mean, I am so thrilled, so honored to have this next guest on. And it was honestly a surprise, guys. Um, Paul Rosen, uh, a new Facebook friend of mine, uh, whose birthday it is today. Happy birthday, Paul. Um, he actually got me in contact with this gentleman yesterday. And I was supposed to have Dale Weiss on the podcast today. Uh, actually, I was supposed to have Terry Ryan on, and he couldn't make it. Um, Dale Weiss couldn't make it today because he moved back to Manitoba, and the mover showed up. Uh, so he texted me first thing this morning apologizing. He said he could do it if he had to, but uh, obviously, you know, it was no problem. Um, 
and I met this guy yesterday and uh, I sent him a text and um, he said all he needed was 20 minutes and I was nowhere near prepared. Um, but, you know, this guy's a Stanley Cup champion. Uh, unbelievable. A former Saskatoon contact, Saskatoon blazer, uh, the, their midget program. I don't know how he played for both teams two different years because I know they're super competitive back and forth. Uh, like myself, this guy is also a Swift Current Bronco alumni. Um, he amassed over 1,000 oh. professional games, over 600 in the NHL, a sixth-round draft pick in the 1995 draft, 144th overall by the Vancouver Canucks, my hometown team, who I watched growing up, and I watched this guy a lot, even though I'm a forward and he's a D-man from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, former Stanley Cup champion, Brent Sopel. Thank you for taking the time to be here with us today. Oh, thanks for uh, inviting me and you know, allowing me some time to, to chit-chat and learn more about myself. Brent, before we go any further, I'm going to be perfectly honest. We, we were already talking for a few minutes here, and um, I don't know if I didn't press record or what, but that's a rookie mistake. I hope you don't find me for that. I know you're a wily old vet. Uh, um, obviously, you've had a lot of experience um, in hockey, uh, in life. You've had a, you know, you're making a news these days, not so much for your hockey career, but more for your courage and your strength for coming out and um, speaking the truth, um, speaking about your struggles with dyslexia and alcoholism and, and possibly drug addiction. And these things are not easy to talk about. Um, you know, my podcast is called Hockey to Heroin. Those are two words that do not go together. And I certainly never in a million years thought that I would ever be homeless on Hastings in Vancouver, um, using the drugs I was using uh, or ending up behind bars in jail. And um, it still shocks me to this day because now when I'm, I'm clear thinking and, and clean, uh, it just feels so good. And um, I think it's a, it's a big struggle for hockey players uh, to find their way um, in life after hockey, Brent. And uh, from my understanding of it, your new passion for, for your awareness and dyslexia is really giving you a new purpose in life. Is that fair to say? Oh, 100%. And, you know, you're exactly right. Um, you know, I played for our 18 years. So um, I went from school to pro hockey to the real world at the age of 40. And it was a slap in the face. Um, you know, we, we don't live in the real world when you're going to school. You know, you do, we don't live in the real world when we're playing hockey. And I was deer in headlights, completely lost with, you know, learning disorders that you talk about, dyslexia and dysgraphia and ADHD. And how the hell am I going to get a job? I can't do this. I had zero self-esteem. So uh, that's when my alcohol and drug abuse uh, got completely uh, out of control. And, you know, I was not far away from, you know, from dying. Uh, man, I'm, well, I'm, I'm really happy that you didn't. And I can relate to that. Uh, I've had so many overdoses, um, scary times and times where my family, you know, really thought that they were going to lose me. And um, I'm sure and times where I was alone, too. And I, I think those are the times that scare me the most. I'm sure that you can definitely relate to that. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's certainly not easy. Um, taking these steps, Brent, to come out, um, I, I've done my research a little bit. Uh, dyslexia, for people that don't know, is, is my understanding of it. And I, have, I actually have a friend, um, a friend who's in jail right now, um, somebody that I met in jail. Um, good kid. And, you know, he had a really rough upbringing and he knows nothing but jail. This kid cannot read. He cannot write. And he's not a kid. I mean, he's 27 years old. Um, I remember, you know, having to read everything coming in and I writing. I was trying to do a schoolwork for him in there and help him. And, um, it, you know, and I could just see it in him and, and see it in his self-esteem. And he wouldn't even want to try to read. He wouldn't even want to try to write because people, even guys in there were making fun of him. And I would stand up and be like, yo, man, shut the fuck up. Like, honestly, I'll, I'll bang you out right now. Like, that was my mentality, sticking up for this guy. And, and because it's it's horrible. And so I can imagine what that must have been like for you going through school from a young age. So at what age, Brent, did you really realize that, you know, this is something that you're actually suffering from and, you know, that this is more common than than maybe you originally thought? You know, I didn't find out till I was 33. You know, I ended up um, getting my daughter tested um, then um, went back 
And that's when we connected the dots that I had dyslexia. But going through school, it was a complete nightmare. Um, you know, you talk about self-esteem. I had none. I've never had any. Um, I always use it like a tank of gas. My self-esteem has never been higher in a corner tank. You know, just simple things of reading. Um, everybody else can do it. You know, why can't I? And let me tell you, it 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 defeats you. It takes everything out of you. Um, no matter what you are, how good you are, how smart you are, how dumb you are, if you don't have self-esteem, you're worthless. And that was me. You know, I was reading at a grade four level in high school. They passed me because of who I was. And, you know, Saskatoon, you know, you're, in a, you're a hockey player. Here you go. Write my name on the final and, you know, pass a class. But my education probably doesn't take me past grade eight. You know, let me tell you, it's, uh, it, you almost killed me. Well, you know, almost killed me. That's uh, the self-esteem part of it. You know, uh, you talk about imprisonment. 50 to 60% of people in prison in the world have dyslexia. And wow. 65% of us are addicted to drugs and alcohol because of, you know, the pain and suffering. You, you're told you're dumb. You're told you're stupid. You're lazy. And after a while, you start believing that. And now you, here I am trying to enter the world, world at 40 years old. Um, after getting divorced, you took all my money. How many, I can't get a job. You know, I can't work in a corporate America. I've got all these issues. You know, and here we are four years later, still haven't found a job. Yeah. And it's it's extremely difficult. So, I mean, from my, what I've read and the things you're doing, Brent, you have the Brent Sobel Foundation, uh, raising money and awareness for dyslexia. Um, I heard on Spit and Jiggles that, that Biz Nasty has uh, agreed to do some things for you. And that's it. fucking incredible. That's If that's happening and he's doing that and whatever, that's fucking great. He's an awesome dude and he's got lots of support. So all the power to you guys. I think that was awesome. Um, uh, I know you do a golf charity event and, and you know, so like, the, you know, the way that I see it, Brent, like to me, that is work, right? Like, um, you, you know, you might not have a nine to five job or, uh, you know what I mean? Or you're not playing hockey anymore, or maybe you're not even getting a fucking paycheck. I'm not sure that's none of my business, but I'll tell you what you talking to me in a text yesterday. And you know, you just saying you're proud of me, this and that you were fucking working yesterday because you changed you really like lit up my life yesterday. You don't even know, right? So, you know, you got to. I am proud. I know, and I and and and, 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 and and I and that's the thing is like when you said it, uh, I I believed you. You know what I mean? And I could I could tell that you were sincere. Um, and and talking to our mutual friend there, uh, who I just started talking to the other day too. But uh, you know, just how he speaks to you and, and people that I've spoken to briefly just about who you are. And yes, you know what? I have issues. You have issues. We're human. We all make mistakes. We're all imperfect. Um, and like you said, uh, dealing with that no self-esteem is I'll, I'll tell you, I'll share a story. So I had a lot of self-esteem growing up um, in a lot of areas. Um, you know what I mean? Like I will say that. However, when I was stripped of my hockey career and all of a sudden, you know, I'm a drug addict and I lost all my friends. I'm fucking on Hastings for crazy. You know, Vancouver, man. Like I was <laughs> oh, on yeah. Hastings for seven. I was on seven, seven fucking months. I was down there, man. Like grinding it out like IV drug user, like not good, mm -hmm. man. Like, you know what I mean? Like a fucking zombie and going, you know, and I, I always say that I was like, you know, I, when I got taken to jail I was like an SPCA rescue you know what I mean like I got rescued because um when I got out of jail uh you know I even after I got I had to, I had to move to Ontario because even after getting out of jail for two years there almost two years I still was got sucked back down there almost instantaneously and I relapsed on my mom's uh fucking back lawn about a week after I got into jail or out of jail woke up to cops and that over top of me narcanning me and like fuck my parents everyone's crying my family and finally they just sent me out to Ontario and because I was like I gotta go and like you know I had some struggles out here but uh I've been great for the last six months and something just feels so different and like finding that meaning and purpose so like this to me this podcast it may not 
pay my bills ever. I mean, it's not going to be my job, but look, it's connecting me with you. And it's connecting me with so many people, um, non-hockey players, non-athletes, just people, man. And the support and me being able to lend my support, that is the work that I want to be able to focus on. And, and I think you're doing that work, man. You, man, should be so proud of yourself, man. Like, do you ever stop to realize and think and, and, really stop and have you ever looked yourself in the mirror like because that's hard to do like when you get clean I don't know when you got clean or sober have you ever had to look yourself in the mirror and look yourself in the eyes and be like hey man I love you like tell yourself you love yourself like it's a hard thing to do I don't know if you've ever done it but you should try yeah. but have that's, you ever actually taken the time to be like hey you know what Brent you're, you're doing pretty fucking great you're doing pretty fucking good man like tell yourself that do you do that yeah I do you know and uh, you know I talk about self-love all the time you know um you know, my, my, my past, you know, I wouldn't change it because it got me here today. And, you know, I always say, you know, what's my legacy want going to be? I don't want it to be hockey. You know, I want it to be my foundation where I'm helping kids with dyslexia and uh, anybody's an addict or anybody who, who's, who's struggling. Um, you know, as long as I can help people, that's all I care about. And, you know, being there for you or, you know, uh, Rosie or, you know, I, I – I love doing that. And, you know, I've had pretty much everything in my life happen to me. So I'm going to, you know, I'll tell you truthfully what I went through and I'll help you any way I can. Cause I, I'm not reading it out of chapter 12. Like, you know, the counselors go to that haven't been through this. I lived through this, you know, every single day and, you know, I'm proud of where I am today. 100%. I think I'm at, uh, uh, 1338 days, you know, sober. Um, Wow. Each day gets better, Incredible. you know, each day gets better, but that's self-love, you know, um, I didn't have self-love for a long time. So, you know, I got to love myself completely before I can yeah. love anybody and, else completely. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's certainly a process, Brent, isn't it? And, uh, I don't know about you, but, um, for me, it's, it's still, a, it's a, something that I'm struggling with on a daily basis to be able to to uh, really let myself believe that maybe I'm worth it, that maybe that I do have something to give after all the shit that I've gone through, after all the people that I've hurt, after everything, all the letdowns and disappointments, all the time I've wasted in jail and all the time I've lost with my kids. You know, there is something that fucking good can come out of this. And you're showing me that. Um, from what you're doing, you know, and I'm going to have, I get to, I'm going to have Sheldon Kennedy on the podcast tomorrow and, um, you know, another Swift Current Bronco alumni, uh, who obviously went through a lot of shit and, um, you know, and him and I are going to touch on that a little bit because that's something that I haven't really been open about. But, um, when I talk to him, you know, that's another topic for another day, but yeah. again, it's people like you and people like Sheldon. Um, that are really leading the way in the charge because, and especially with dyslexia, because I mean, really, like you said, um, people think you're lazy or dumb or, and it's not the case, is it? Because, um, you know, a lot of these statistics and, uh, I've heard them because I've, I've listened to some of the stuff you've done. Um, but maybe you want to remind the people listening, uh, out there uh, about how incredible, how incredibly smart people with dyslexia really are. Yeah, you know, dyslexia is one in five. So you got 20% of the population have it. Uh, you know, to give you a comparison, autism is one in 65. Dyslexia is hereditary. You know, autism's not. So it's it's not going anywhere. Um, it continue. I passed it down to my daughter. And my daughter's very, very happy that I passed it down to her. But you got some of the richest people uh, in the world that have it. You know, we're talking on cell phones, Steve Jobs, Thomas Edison, um, uh, Richard Branson. So just because we can't do the simple things, uh, you know, of reading, we learn a little bit differently. But, you know, we're outside the box. You know, we're born with our right brain wired differently. You know, for an example, if I'm driving down the highway, I will tell you every single license plate on the car that drives by me or I drive by. Um, my whole time on the highway, if that's two hours, seven hours, 22 hours, you know, so that's kind of how my brain works. Um, my spatial awareness, 50% of people at NASA working are dyslexic. 
Wow. But also 50% of people in prison in the whole world are dyslexic too. So, you know, there's kids out there that learn differently. That's it. You know, it's a learning difference, not a learning disorder. I still call it a learning disorder because the world's not educated to know the difference. But there's some brilliant kids out there that could change the world and aren't going to get the opportunity. And, you know, I tell my story raw like you, you know, but you should be, you should be proud of your story because it got you here today. It's made you who you are today. You know, it's pain. We all go through pain. Life, life is, a, is a bitch. But I wouldn't change it for a world. Um, you know, a lot of pain with my kids and through a divorce and, you know, you know, a lot of our stories is, is fairly similar, but you know, here we are today, uh, you know, chatting on a Sunday, you know, hopefully we'll be able to, you know, save one life, um, that one person know they're worth it, um, to reach out and we're there for them and I'm there for you. And, you know, this is just a, a brotherhood that we just, you know, keep building, uh, day after day. Man, you have no idea, like getting this, like, you know, you talked about playing in Vancouver and um, you're, you're born in what, 1977, right? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. You, so you're 10 years, so yeah. you're 10 years older than I am. So, so, you know, like I, you know, I watched you play a lot, you know what I mean? And um, you always joke around saying you're the slowest guy, you had the worst boots in the league or whatever. Um, but you were a hell of a hockey player and you don't fucking make the NHL and you don't get 40 points as a defenseman in the NHL unless you're a hell of a fucking hockey player. So let's, let's put all kidding aside for a second here. Um, and let's talk about the hockey side of things for a second. Um, you know, when you played junior, cause you played, you know, I know you played for the Saskatoon blades and then you were with the Broncos, um, in swift current, uh, what was it like back then? Uh, was there a lot of drinking? Um, were there drugs around in, in the Western League? Um, and when you went to pro, uh, you know, in your first couple of years, did you drink a lot or were you more focused on the hockey? You know, you know um, drinking's everywhere in hockey. And, you, know, you know, junior hockey, um, you know, NHL, um, that's, that's the way of life. That's the way it was, you know. You go, uh, you know, fly into a city in the NHL, you put your bags in, you go to the restaurant, you know, have three or four uh, beers before dinner, um, have dinner, have three or four more, uh, have three or four more after, you know. And, you know, can't tell you how many games I played, you know, played hungover. You know, that was just, that was the way it was. You know, now they're, you know, eating their carrot sticks at night and doing their yoga. And back in the day, we're, you know, we're all drinking and we're drinking together and, it didn't matter if it was the night before game, um, after the game, um, beer was, you know, beer was everywhere. I, like I said, I was iced from the inside out and that was cold beer. Um, nothing better than a, than a cold beer right after the game. Yeah. I mean, it, it is everywhere. I mean, look at, we have beer league hockey, even, <laughs> I mean, that's <laughs> most people, that's all they play. Right. I mean, realistically, that is the majority of where people are playing the people that are listening are playing beer league hockey and um, you know, after the games sitting around crushing a bunch of bunch of beers with the guys and probably driving home, um, you know, not even thinking, uh, you know, probably half of them stopping to grab a ball of Coke or something too on the way. Cause that's just the way it goes. And you don't realize and, how much alcohol is everywhere until you try and sober up. Yep. Yep. I mean, so did you, did you go to treatment? Or is this something that you just kind of realized? And how did you come, like, how did that really come about? How did you realize where it was like, okay, hey, enough is enough. And how long have you really been struggling? Like, how long have you known? You know, so, um, like I said, drug use got really ramped up big time um, right after, you know, I retired from the game of hockey. And, you know, living in Chicago, um, all my family's back in Canada. So, you know, I was able to run, run, run wild, you know, downtown Chicago, you know, it's a $4 billion drug industry, get whatever I want, drop of a hat, you know, and, you know, I was at it for a couple of years um, before my parents came down for a wedding. You know, I, I completely made a debacle of it all. Three day, two days later, there was an intervention with uh, 
my agent, my dad, and a couple of friends, and they threw me in rehab. Um, I was not, you know, I wasn't going to stop. Only thing that was going to stop was, you know, death. And that was probably a couple months out. And uh, if it wasn't for them to doing that intervention, um, taking me to rehab in, in California, and that's what really uh, started this process uh, to where we are today. I had to get sober to really understand who I was and what my life was and learn to love myself. And that's still a process and be okay to talk about my struggles and be open with, uh, with everybody and with the public and um, where I'm at and what's going on and writing my stories and you know, being here today. Well, it's, it's been an incredible journey, hasn't it? And I love how you say that, like, you know, you wouldn't change it because, yes, everything that we go through, it, it certainly makes us who we are. Um, I say it all the time, too. Like, as much as it's embarrassing to say I've been been to jail and I have a criminal record, like, I couldn't even come visit you in Chicago if I wanted to. Like, that's embarrassing. I couldn't, you know what I mean? Like, I never in a million years <laughs> thought I would end up in jail. Don't be, don't be embarrassed by it. You know, you can't be embarrassed by it because that's, the one thing that I've learned is that you have to clean out every single uh, skeleton in every single closet. You know, got to go back right yeah. to day one and whatever that is. And you know what? It is what it is. You know, it's got you where you are today. So you'll take those negatives and turn it into positives because, you know, we can't change the past. We can't change the future. We can only change right now because we don't know if God's going to call our card in two hours or four hours, you know, um, instead of taking that negative approach, you know, glass half full. It's true. And I admit, you know, it's, you know, I try to look at things that way I do. And it's always easier for me to, you know, tell other people and it's harder for me to kind of, you know, implement yeah. it in my own life, I guess. But at the same time, it's, I, I don't know, man. So what, you just went to rehab the one time and you've been sober for, for, so how long, when was this? When would you go, when was this intervention exactly? So, um, I went to rehab September 1st of 2017 or 2016. Okay. So my calculator is, uh, yeah, 1,338 days sober today. Wow. That's awesome. So are you, this is, you know, and this is, you don't have to share it or whatever, but everybody has their own different sort of recovery based program and that. And I used to be very involved in the different programs and you're not supposed to, you know, talk about it in the media and this and that. Um, but just as far as support groups, we'll say, um, is that something that helps you or do you kind of build your own support groups? Uh, what's the support been like from your former teammates and the NHL? You know what? Um, to get sober, I had to walk away from from everything with hockey. You know, um, as much as you know, winning a Stanley Cup and you know playing as long as I did, there's it brought a lot of you know a lot of ugliness to my life. So, you know, I had to step away from from everybody and all that to understand and who I am. And I don't want that hockey life to be you know who I you know who I'm associated with and who I am. You know. When you get sober, nobody else changes, you do. So I had to relearn my life and relearn where to go and what to do and what decisions to make and um, how to handle certain situations and where to go. And, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's been a process, but, um, you know, I'm on the phone right now or three or four hours a day, you know, talking to different people, uh, counseling them through, yeah, in your certain situations, uh, drug and alcohol or uh, abuse or whatever that is. And um, my oldest son, you know, just turned thirty. Um, you know, he's he's sober two and a half years uh, because of me. And you know, so my, my sober being sober means more than just me. And I got other lives that are counting on me. And you know, God, you know, God saved me. I got a God shot that, you know the guy who told my story was the first time I've ever heard it. And that's when I knew exactly where I was supposed to be. And if I didn't get sober, you know, I would have been dead a long, long time ago. Yeah. 
Well, I like I said, I'm just, I'm really glad you're not because um, yeah, you have no idea, man. So like, I only started this podcast like three weeks ago, and then I had uh, you know I had one childhood friend on who's a scout for the the Arizona Coyotes. His name's Kevin Peterson, who really just took a shot in the dark. Like I hadn't even talked to him in a long time. For all he knows, I could have been completely fucked up. Um, and you know he 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 did it, and um, you know it was kind of whatever. Uh, but it went all right. And, and from there, I, I got my buddy Jesse on, who's team issued, uh, limited, owns that company. And um, from there, I got a couple other guys. And then I got Terry Ruskowski and Doug fucking McLean on. And uh, uh, and then I got my buddy, the boxer. And then all of a sudden, I'm getting, you know, Sheldon Kennedy. And I got you on here. And it's like, you know, it's only been, you know, I've been clean for about, you know, uh, I want to, I'd have to look at the exact day because I'll, I'll be honest with you. Um, over the past 10 years, I've gotten clean so many times and relapsed so many times that it's like, I'm not even to the point where it's like, I'm not even putting that day on the calendar anymore. I'm just living it one day at a time because I'm, I can't do it that way because I've got to a year clean a couple times here and there, but I'll, I'll, I'll tell you this. I've never in this entire, I don't think ever in my life, never in my mind, just in my addiction or anything. Never have I ever been doing something or been in a mindset where I've been connecting with people and feel like I act like you have a purpose. Like I feel the same way um, without hockey. You know what I mean? That was the hardest thing. Like even when I fucking didn't even want to play hockey anymore, it was like, well, fuck, I don't know anything else. Like what the mm -hmm. fuck am I going to do? You know what I mean? Like that's what people have absolutely no, you know, and let's just see any professional sports, that's all we did. You know, I did that my whole life. I walked away at 40 years old and then, then people are like, Oh, what do you want to do? I don't fucking know. I just did something for 40 years. Now I have zero purpose. I was told where to be, when to be, what time school, what time the bus was, what time the flight was, what time the game was. Now I have no schedule, no purpose, no nothing. And I'm supposed to survive this. Um, that's that's how every one of us, when we walk away from the game, no matter if you have millions of dollars in the bank or not, you got to have a purpose in life. And it is the hardest, you know, it's been the you know, hardest four years of my life, 100%. I believe you 100% because it's been the hardest 10 years of my life. And I even went and I never, I never even played one regular season game in the NHL and I'm not saying that I could have been a, a long but I mean fuck I quit when I probably would have got drafted and then I got you know what I mean I just then I got a girl pregnant and fuck got another girl pregnant and then I instead of I signed my first pro contract instead of training I decided I would do coke all summer um and it was just a nightmare and I went to I remember going to playing in Traverse City Michigan in that fucking training camp and just or the the ex, uh, preseason tournament there and just being like in hor I was fucking <laughs> horrified of myself like it was horrible like I had spent my whole life thinking like okay you know you want to be a pro hockey player and it's like man you couldn't even fucking I went to the gym like four times I think I was on the ice like three times and uh it was just bad and you know what the difference is when you even in the American League you go from junior to pro it's a whole nother fucking ball game right and uh <laughs> And then a whole lot of like, game that's not training. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's just it, right? And um, you know, and then from there, you know, I got into the oxys really bad, and from there, I got into the heroin and the fentanyl, and uh, yeah, it, it's just it's been it's been fucking crazy. And I just I never even if it wasn't for the oxys, though, I would have never ever ever done heroin. There's just no fucking way um, because there's just. You know what I mean? I was I was to yeah. the point where I needed it because my body was addicted to it, and there was nowhere I could get these oxys. And somebody mm -hmm. had heroin. Fuck! If somebody told me I had to eat dog shit to feel better, I would have eaten the dog shit. I'm not even yeah. kidding. So it no, was I'm like, okay, not. give it to me. So I was like, give it to me, and I, you know, I sm I remember it. I smoked it off foil, and I felt like such a fucking drug addict. You know, at that time, I had snorted a lot of coke, um, drank, I'd done ecstasy, that kind of stuff, party drugs. Yeah. And I've really been addicted to the oxys, but I remember my baby mom's Brittany being like, she found out or whatever. She's like, call me a junkie. And she's like, you're just a heroin addict. And I'm like, no, there's a difference. This isn't heroin. I'm trying to justify it that the oxys yeah. are different than the heroin, but they're not. It's just a synthetic version. They're actually probably worse. Well, once I did the heroin, it was easy. It was actually easier to find than the oxys. It was cheaper. Yeah. And I don't, I think I did oxys twice after that. And from there, all of a sudden I'm doing heroin um, and now I'm hanging out with a completely different fucking crowd. And, um, 
you know, now all of a sudden there's other drugs around and other people around and it just, it starts, I got sucked into it pretty quick, but if it wasn't for fucking hockey, man, I bet you I would have been long gone at fucking 16, 17 years old with all my mental health issues and shit, you know? Oh, 100%. And you know, I'm, you know, um, Molly's ecstasy's Coke, you know, uh, that was my, I love that, you know, leaving the house with, you know, pocketfuls of Molly's and ecstasy's and Adderall's and oh, it just, you know, it was amazing. But for me, you know, the oxys, you know, didn't do anything to me. <clears throat> Thank God, because all my injuries, all my broken bones, um, you know, I take the oxys and bites, you know, by the handful and, you know, I wasn't affected by it. Thank God, because as many injuries and, you know, how many times I broke my bones and playing with broken bones. And I think every time I broke a bone, I finished the game and, you know, I, you know, I was, I was popping them, but I, you know, I didn't get affected. Thank God, because, you know, I was inches away um, from, you know, doing the same thing as you. And that's what people don't understand is, you know, you take that one, that one oxy and, you know, if it's uh, your, your, you know, your blood type or my blood type, it's two different paths and um, that's all it takes. And people have no idea how easy, how quickly uh, that thing could snowball. Yeah. Well, the thing is people don't know with, with opiates, with, um, you know, with heroin, fentanyl, oxys, Percocets, um, these things are painkillers, but they're not just physical painkillers. They're also emotional painkillers. So I remember the first time I ever did an oxy. Okay. Like, this was back in 2009. Um, I've never talked about this on the podcast, so I'm glad I'm talking about this. It's crazy. I never wanted to talk with Brent Sopel about this, but who better now, I guess, right? I feel more comfortable talking with you than I think I have anybody else. So here goes. Um, you know, it's 2009, and, uh, you know, I just remember doing a lot of coke, and somebody, it doesn't matter who, uh, somebody close to me was like, here, just do one of these or whatever. And uh, I remember I did to go to sleep and I remember doing it and fuck, I puked. And it was an oxy 80 milligrams. So for people that don't know, uh, one Percocet is a, it has five milligrams of oxycontin in it. So, or oxycodone, it, the only difference is short lasting, long lasting, doesn't matter. Fuck who cares. But I did an 80 milligram. So whatever the math is, 80 divided by five fucking, it's like 14 fucking perks or something like that. And I snorted it and you know, I, I remember I puked, but I remember feeling fucking great because at that time I had uh, the, you know, I not got a girl in Swift Current pregnant, um, totally pulled a piece of shit move and was like, that's not my kid, da, 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 even though I knew it was. And then this other, and then my girlfriend back home got pregnant. Um, and basically I, it was like, I had to choose one or the other and it was horrible. I knew I was making a big mistake and it was fucking killing me because it was, you know, I, I, I knew it was wrong and uh, I've always known it was wrong. It was the biggest mistake of my life. And uh, so I started drowning myself out with these oxy. I did these oxys and it was like, fuck, nothing else mattered, man. And the, the funny thing about that is that that was the one summer that was, so that was the summer after my first year pro. So I'd blow my knee out that year and whatever. Well, anyways, I decided that I was like, you know what, this summer I'm going to fucking train because I have to, like, you know, if you want to be a hockey player, now you have to train. I was 22 or whatever, about to be 22. And I fucking trained every goddamn day, but I was fucking addicted to the oxys. So when I went to fucking training camp, you know what I said? I said I had fucking H1N1 because that's what was going on back then. Um, so I failed the phys. What's that? Isn't that, blue, is that the, called the bird flu? Is that what they're calling it? H1N1? Yeah, whatever. Yeah. yeah, it was back. That's what was going on back then. And so that was my excuse. So I fucking, you know, they kicked me off the team. It was in the coast or something. And I was like, wow, this is really cutthroat. Like, fuck, this is crazy. Like, you know, like whatever. And uh, so I went home and I remember, because I'll tell you, I went to this town. I left. Um, I remember I tried to get clean off these oxys. And I was like, fuck, I got to get off these. This is crazy. Like, I'm sick. Um, and so I was, I had no idea. Right. So somebody's like, here, if you take this methadone, which is like a prescription, whatever kind of, uh, people can look it up if they want to know what it is, but here, take it, take this a, a little bit every day until you're off of it. And I'm thinking, okay, this is going to fucking work. Well, God, I was doing 12 to 15 pills, 12 to 15, 80 milligram oxy pills a day. That's where my habit was at. Um, never mind all the cocaine and everything else. So I went there with this little 200 milligrams of methadone uh, a week before training camp and tried to kick it in the one buddy's basement of his house there. 
a teammate of mine. Nobody knew. Couldn't fucking do it. I was so sick. And I said H- H1N1, so they kicked me off the team. Uh, I went to Holland to play. Uh, I, I went home, started doing the oxys again. Then I went to Holland. Uh, I went to Holland with like five pills, thinking I'm going to kick it there. Worst 21 days of my fucking life. I can't even tell you. I didn't sleep. It was horrible. And I came home and then I started using the pills and I got into heroin shortly after. But, um, you know, those are the dark moments. And like a lot of my using was alone. It wasn't, you know, yes, the Coke, the party drugs when I was younger. Sure. But like I was in a lot of darkness. Did Was that where your addiction took you? Or were you to the point where you were drinking and using alone? You know, I didn't, you know, living, living on my own. Um, yeah, you know, Tuesday morning, I'm going to pop in, you know, pop in ecstasy or, you know, you know going to have a couple beers in the, you know, on the couch on Tuesday morning. And, um, you know, a lot of my, you know, I, I party like a rock star, you know, get up Friday morning and go to bed Sunday night. Um, who the hell knows where I was and what I was doing, but it was amazing because I didn't have to, uh, you know, focus on, you know, the inside and dig down and, uh, understand why that, you know, why that pain was there. And that's, you know, you talk about, you, you know, take that oxy. Yeah. I, you know, it smooths over all that pain and, uh, you know, we just keep piling on there and piling on there. Um, and that's what the closet, clean out the closets. You know, I, I was doing the opposite. I was, you know, building a brick wall as high as I can over my closets and, um, <laughs> doing some stupid things and, you know, thank God that, you know, um, I didn't die, um, you know, didn't get a DUI, didn't kill anybody. Um, you know, it, it's insane the things that I was doing. Uh, I Hey, listen, man, I know exactly what you were doing because I was doing the same things, peeking out the blinds, the paranoia, the fucking crazy, uh, the crazy shit, just the amass, you know, you obviously had a lot more money than I did, but I had to resort to doing things to make my money because I had a thousand dollar a day habit easy. And after I ran out of money from hockey, which I never really had that much from in comparison to you, um, you know, I had, that's why I had to start, you know, and it took me a long time to, to turn to a life of like crime and violence and that. And that's why, you know, eventually I went to jail and they say that, you know, your addiction will take you to jails, institutions and death. And it's true. I've been, I've been to all and they brought me back from death more than once. So, um, you know, I, I can tell you. That, that and I remember sitting and hearing that I'm like yeah yeah not me I'm stronger than that I'm I can beat you know what I mean yeah. the cocky 21 year old fuck <laughs> and I knew nothing and uh, you know I got rinsed by this addiction for the last 10 years um, but you know I've never felt better man and, and like it's people like you and uh, you have no idea man like you, so when you say you haven't had a job for four years you know you've been working on yourself. And uh, you're doing fucking amazing work, man. So just know that for sure. Uh, when was the last time you had the skates on? You know, I coached um, two teams, U16, U18 this year um, for the first time. And, you know, again, I like I said, I had to step away from, you know, from everything. And it took a long time to uh, understand who I was. And like I said, when you get sober, nothing else changes. Um, you change. So, uh, it took me a long time to to be okay with with my struggles and be okay, you know, having learning disorders and and struggling with the the simplest things. Um, being, you know, now I'm 43 years old and being okay with never reading a a book to your kids. Uh, it, you know, like I said, it took me took me a long time to to be okay with all that. You, so what's the relationship with like with your kids now and and uh, how was it while you were going through your addiction and your alcoholism? Oh, what you know, it wasn't good at all. You know, um, you know, the alcohol, drugs and alcohol obviously uh, was number one. And um, yeah, you know, did a lot of stupid things and drove with them. And um, thank God you know, the relationship is is uh, is getting better. You know, I was traveling so many years while they were they were born. Um, my daughters are 16 and 18 right now. Um, so they're uh, sophomores and seniors here in the U S and that'd be grade 10 and, you know, grade 12 in, in Canada. And, uh, and they're, you know, they're doing great. Yeah. Well, they're teenage girls. They don't want to see me anyways. They just want, want to uh, want the paycheck. They want the uh, ATM card. So, uh, but it's, it's a work in progress, you know, did a lot of damage. I and mean, like you, you talked about, uh, a lot of the a lot of the damage you did to people um, hurt a lot of people. You know, I, I did the same thing, and 
it's it's an everyday process to um, repair that. And all you can do is try to be a better person uh, each and every day. Yeah, I mean, that that makes me feel hopeful because, like I said, I, I have a, the one son that I've never met. And the, the girl is actually, I've said this on the podcast, she's doing great. And she, uh, you know, I've actually spoken to her uh, a few weeks ago. She, she's been always super supportive of me and wondering what I'm doing and uh, wanting the best for me, even though I was horrible to her. And uh, this kid's been adopted and she has a kid with another guy and uh, she doesn't want me, you know, obviously at this time. And uh, I've tried when he was younger. He's like 13 now, almost. Mm-hmm. He'll be 13 in November. Um, but you know, I tried when he was four to go out there, but again, I was all fucked up at that time, but I was still trying to do things the right way. But, uh, by that time I, you know, she's like, you made your decision. He's in a good place. And at that time I had to respect it and I still do, but, um, I have two kids, Brooklyn and Brody back in, uh, they're back in BC. And I mean, I haven't spoken to them in in a few years and it's just fucking crushing me. Like I'm trying and, uh, you know, their mom won't really let me talk to them, but I guess I got a message from the, from a mutual friend of ours saying, you know, just keep doing getting clean and well, as long as i can show a six month you know hair sample test that i'm clean <laughs> then i can have contact with my kids so that's coming up here soon so right. i'm fucking jumping on that right away and i'm gonna try to do that because i mean i sent them letters when i was in jail <laughs> i've written them and tried to call them to get, i'll get returned to sender it was really sad but it's, um you know my it's it's tough but it gives me hope you know and you're right uh there's a lot of damage and it takes time to build these relationships back so you've been sober clean and sober a lot longer than i have um, you've been able to mend a lot of relationships, I assume, but have there been relationships that maybe you damaged that you haven't been able to mend that that's maybe been a challenge? Yeah, no, absolutely. And you know, when you, uh, when you get sober, you've got to eliminate a lot of you know, relationships, you know, um, the people you're hanging out with and you're partying with, you know, th- those can't be your friends anymore. So, you know, I had to clean a lot of uh, closets, the inventory, a lot of people out of my life. And, um, you know, almost start, you know, start a new life and, um, you know, still mending today, you know, it'll probably be a work in process for, you know, forever, but you know, your kids will come around when you're, when you're ready, they'll be ready. And, um, you know, you're not ready yet. You know, you're still early in your process, you know, and you're doing a great job, but we need to build your foundation, um, a lot stronger, you know, for those kids. And that's what you have to, you keep in mind that's the foundation you're building, you know, for them. And um, they don't know a lot of the stuff because they were younger and that's the good. Yep. yep. No, they, they for sure. And uh, I mean, obviously missed years and it's unfortunate, but you're right. And I am very, uh, very new. I mean, done this before, but like I said, something's just different this time. I have a purpose. I have, I'm focused. I've never been this focused on anything in my life. Other, I don't even think I was ever this focused on hockey before. And um You know, I'm just, uh, it's not even so much like, oh, I'm just focused on that, this podcast. I mean, I'm just focused in general where it's like, hey, it's time to get your shit together, man. You're 32. Like, uh, one more go around, I'm not going to make it out. I can already tell you. I'm either going to end up dead, killing somebody or, um, you know whatever those are the only options at this point and it's probably going to be me ending up dead you know what i mean uh um and i'm just there's so much to live for man and uh like look at this new friendship i've made with you is just fucking incredible you don't even know um how much that means to me uh you know like i I wanted to ask you a question so your time in the khl what was that like and where was your headspace at? Did you drink a lot over there? Uh, I know you played, I can't pronounce the name, but I know it's a really, really, really bad city. Maybe yeah. you could tell the people about that. Uh, yeah, it's uh, Novo Kuznets, which is uh, right in the middle of Siberia, five hours east flight from Moscow. And it's uh, it's a heroin capital of, of the world. There's a synthetic heroin called Crocodile Tears that was there. Um, you know, my time in KHL was it was great. You know, I learned a lot about the cultures, but was I drinking? Oh, you know, absolutely. Um, my first year there, I was, uh, I was, I was drinking nonstop, you know, all the time. And, you know, it was uh, a long ways away from home. And I think, you know, fans, we get on Europeans that, that come across here and they don't perform uh, right away. I, I went over to Russia at, I think I was 35 years old and I got off the flight and I'm like, where the fuck am I? And I'm 35 years old. And like, you know, I tell people all the time, I speak Canadian. I haven't graduated to American. So definitely didn't speak any Russian. Um, 
I learned how to order two beers uh, in Russian. That was the first thing I you know I learned. But oh, absolutely, you know, uh, drinking was uh, was a mainstay for me. Um, you know, my whole time over there, uh, in between games, after games, um, yeah, definitely was on the bottle. So, like, what about what about moving forward for you? Um, you mentioned that your son, um, you know, is a couple years sober. That must have been, I mean, that's incredible, right? So you got you got sober first. Um, what was that like to be able, to have to watch him go through before he got sober? And the reason why I ask is because I put my dad through so much shit, right? And my dad is a retired firefighter. He's a scout for the Saskatoon Blades. We're a very well respected guy. Like nobody in my family's been to jail. Um, nobody does drugs. You know what I mean? So, um, you know, he was a single dad. Uh, he did a fucking phenomenal job with me. I can't even tell you like how he went above and beyond. You know, and uh, I just see the disappointment in him, and he just fucking hates my life now. You know, but I just wonder like what what that was like for you to watch your son. That must have been hard. Or I just kind of curious to hear your perspective of it, so I can just kind of have an idea. Yeah, you know, um, the old saying, you got, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make a drink. And, and you know, to get sober, uh, you got to hit your rock bottom. And everybody's rock bottom is different. And, you, you, you know, there's nothing you can do. You know, I could have let, let him to the water, but I couldn't make him drink. And, um, you know, he, he realized, you know, I got a call from him. And... Um, He's like, I, you know, I got to stop. And, um, you know, that was uh, the conversation, you know, how it started. And, you know, I, two and a half years sober, just had um, this, uh, you know, his first kid. Um, you know, so I'm a grandfather. And, you know, like I said, my sobriety is bigger than just Congratulations. me. Congratulations. Thank you. You know, so when I wake up in the morning, it's just not for me. You know, I've got him. And, um, all the other people that, that I work with and I know I'm like you, if I go back out, huh, I'm going to zero to 10,000 and I'll see you later. I'm not coming back. And I know that. And, you know, I just choose to make the right choices and put myself in, um, different perspectives. And if that's going to bed at 9 PM, that's going to bed at 9 PM. And you know, I was, I drank enough for a lifetime and, you know, uh, was in places that I'm surprised I'm, you know, in Russia that I wasn't killed. Yeah. Well, was it scary over there? Like it must've been a whole different world. I know when I was in the Netherlands, I mean, it was really nice over there. Uh, I actually was so sick, uh, drug sick that I really didn't even explore very much over there, unfortunately. And I quit because I was in such bad shape. Um, but did you spend a lot of time? I mean, obviously you're at the rink a lot, but when you were born at the rink, you said you drank a lot, but were, did you hang out with the guys on the team where there were a lot of guys from Canada? What was the living conditions like? You know, my last year and a half, I was the only North American. Um, again, you in and out of, you know, Sweden, Switzerland, Finland, Kazakhstan, Belarus, Latvia, you know, some, some crazy places that, you know, I can say that, that I was, and, you know, there's some amazing cultures and, you know, St. Petersburg is a beautiful city and Moscow makes New York city look like a suburb, just, you know, completely insane, you know, ass backwards compared to, to the life that, uh, uh, we're used to living over here, you know? So, you know, I, I, I really enjoyed it. You know, obviously my heritage is, is Polish, so I kind of fit in, you know, I wasn't the, the Swede with the blonde hair and blue eyes and stuck out like a sore thumb. Um, you know, I kind of, uh, I blended in, but everybody was very nice and very respectful. You know, there wasn't a lot of English. Um, you know, I was like a European. I knew when the coach was yelling at me and just put, you know, nipped it to my you, which means I don't understand. You know, tell the coach when he's yelling at me that I screwed up. I don't know what he's talking about. Um, <laughs> I don't know, but you know, Again, it's part of my story. I can say I was in all those countries. You know, I met one of my best friends that I speak to weekly uh, in Russia. Um, when I was over there, his his mom was, was dying, and I was going through my divorce. And him and I spent you know every waking moment together, and you know we still talk um, you know weekly. Um, miss him, and you know if I didn't go there, I wouldn't have met him, and I wouldn't have gone to all these opportunities, and I wouldn't have got myself in all this shit. 
to climb back out to be here today. I mean, it certainly makes for a story, doesn't it? I mean, I, I, I mean, I'm more famous or more known, not famous, more known for uh, being the drug addict jailed hockey player than I ever was for actually playing the game. Um, but I feel like I can do a lot more good because of the shit that I've gone through. Um, you know, being able to go out and talk to, you know, uh, junior teams or, you know, it doesn't even have to be hockey players, you know, I just want to deal with people because I think our society is really failing our, our younger kids. I mean, we talked about the dyslexia and the, the different types styles of learning. I've been saying this for years, the way that the kids are learning in schools is so fucking backwards and it is just, it's so outdated. Like, I just don't understand. Like it's so much time wasted. We could be gearing these kids towards real life. Instead yeah, of well, I could go on for hours about that. There's, there's no question. You know, the school system was made 300 years ago and it's, it was made for women. And um, yeah, you know, there, we could go on and on, but you know, you and I have, uh, you know, we have stories and you know, if anybody in the world called me, I know I can help them because I've had just about everything happen to me. So, you know, I'm not a, a psychologist where I didn't, you know, went to school and graduated, but have never lived the life that we've lived. So when I uh, get on the call, you know, I, I help four or five people every single day um, to, to stay sober and to get better. And I help them with information because I've lived it. I live it every single day and counselors, um, a lot of them don't, they've never lived it. So they're reading out of chapter 12 or chapter two. And, you know, a lot of it's, it's, you know, is phony shit, you know, you and I've lived it. So, um, you know, be proud of how you're known because you're going to change lives and you're going to save lives and in the right way and not in hockey, but you're going to save lives. So, you know, be proud of how you're known. Some people might not be, but you should be because you're going to save lives. I appreciate that, Brent. Um, uh, I mean, we've been talking for close to an hour. Your time is extremely valuable, but uh, I have this new segment where it's sort of like ask questions from the fans and there's been quite a bunch of feedback. So if you don't mind me asking a few questions from the people on Facebook, uh, are you yeah, cool with absolutely. that? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Okay. So um, Matthew, uh, he wants to know where your favorite place to play is, who your best teammate is, and what your most unforgettable hockey moment is. You know, it's um, obviously winning the Stanley Cup would be the most uh, memorable moment. I loved, uh, you know, we're on the road so much. Obviously, Vancouver is a beautiful city. Colorado was my favorite road city. Um it's just, you know, the fresh air, all the cities and the big cities that we're in, you know, and for teammates, you know, honestly, um, every one of my teammates thought I was completely out of my fucking mind. And um, my routines, you know, I never, I never slept. You know, I slept like three hours a night. I never took pregame naps. I'd go to the mall or go to Disneyland, like <laughs> completely ass backwards. But, you know, I didn't know I was dyslexic. I didn't know what all that, like my routine, if I literally didn't do my routine exactly every single game, every single day. And, you know, I might as well not gotten dressed. And I can relate to that. I can relate to that because there was times like I had to get everything dressed. I had to do touch my equipment, like everything left first. If I didn't touch my left, everything first. If my, I tape my stick and it touched the ground after I tape it, I might as well not even fucking go on the ice. Mm -hmm. If I wake up in the morning of a game and I put on my shirt and it's on backwards or something, my whole fucking day is fucked. Like still to this day, I have problems with that. So like, you know, I can relate to that. Um, do you still have problems with that kind of like with your routine and that kind of thing? Or are you kind of in a new mindset? No, you know, I, yeah, that was a lot of my dyslexia. Um, it was kind of the glue holding my life together um, with me without knowing what it was. And, you know, obviously you go every, we had a rookie dinner every year and, you know, all of the rookies had to tell a joke and sing a song or whatever. Every single rookie just impersonated me. That's how ass, asinine it was, you know, bouncing around. And, you know, it was – I was a complete mental midget. So uh, I'm okay with routines. It makes sense to me why and what I was doing. 
Um, but, you know, who goes to Disneyland on the day of the game? And the more tired I was walking into the rink, the better I played on the ice. Wow. Yeah, there's times where I was sick and, you know, I had some of my best games too. So uh, maybe, you know, I don't know if it's – it's, might be something to it, but I think it's whatever you're comfortable with, too. Um, the next question uh, comes from Dale Pennick. He says, do you agree with the fans of Vancouver booing Duncan Keith every time he touches the puck? No. You know what? Again, the, the fans have the right. Um, the Vancouver Canucks fans booed me for so long. <laughs> So they, um, they have the right. Um, I don't think, you know, I don't think they, they should, but uh, that's my opinion. And they, they pay their tickets, so they have the right. And, you know, what really did Duncan Keith do? Um, you know, Chicago Blackhawks, you know, we won three Stanley Cups in, you know, in six years. I was lucky enough to be a part of one of them. Just an absolute dynasty. And Duncan Keith will be a Hall of Famer. Um, so I think there'd be worse guys that you could boo than, you know, Duncan Keith. I think they're booing him because he's so good. You know what I mean? Like the, just they're sick of it. They were they they were sick of him just like you know just beating up on them. Uh, this this uh, this question actually comes from uh, my kid's uncle uh, James Dimmick. Uh, he wants to know. He said that he heard that he you had Clark Griswold on your stick <laughs> instead of Sopel. He wants to know if that's true or not. Yes, one hundred percent. And. Um had all my house done in, in uh, Christmas lights. I was, I was Clark Griswold. Um, guys on the team, again, thought I was completely retarded. I had snowman uh, tied to my trees so nobody would steal them and red lights everywhere. You know, I fell off my roof two or three times um, while I was putting up the Christmas lights. Good thing I didn't get injured. Um, Mark Crawford wouldn't, wouldn't have enjoyed that. But, yeah, Clark Griswold uh, they came, came to the rink one day, and uh, the trainers had put it on my – you know, on my stick and, you know, I end up scoring. So it stayed there. <laughs> wow. That's quite the story. I had no idea. That's funny. Um, Byron Richmond wants to, he says, what's it like holding Lord Stanley's cup? And what was your reaction when you realized that you just won the cup? You know, it's, I won the one, you know, a million other times on, on the outdoor rank, but it really is still surreal that, um, that I did win it, and my name is is on there. Um, less than one percent of the world ever get to play the game that we did, and uh, less than one percent ever get to to say they won the Stanley Cup. So it really is very very surreal for me still to this day. Um, can't believe you know when I do talk about it. You know sometimes I got to pinch myself because I am that lucky that I'm able to uh, to say my name is on that. But again, I'm trying to turn that as into a positive and use that as leverage to, to get my foundation and help these kids, you know, because I can get meetings uh, because I did win that Stanley Cup. Yeah. You know, and that's a thing too, right. And um, obviously you won a Stanley Cup. You spent years in the NHL. Your hockey career is a lot more storied than mine ever was. But at the same time, um, just me even playing in the Western Hockey League, playing professional hockey, uh, gives me a platform and maybe gets me an opportunity to talk to guys like you or or maybe some other people um, like Doug McLean or whatever. And it gives me a chance to, to share my story and help people too. So I can relate to that. And definitely, I mean, you want a Stanley Cup, man. So I, I would I would take that in and use it. And maybe that is the whole purpose of your hockey career, man. Like, have you ever thought, been like, you know what? this is what it was all about. Like it wasn't about the hockey. It wasn't about the money. It wasn't about the drugs, the girls, yeah. not drinking, none of it. It was about this. It was about this foundation. It was about me going through this, me finding myself, me finding my purpose and me helping people so that they don't have to go through the same thing that I went through. Isn't that so fucking incredible? Yeah. 100%. I agree with you completely. That's, I think that's what it was, you know, um, I was supposed to meet with president Trump. Um, not because I'm um, Brent Sopel and, you know, Canadian, you know, it's because I'm Stanley Cup winner and um, hockey's given me that platform and my legacy will hopefully be, uh, be my foundation and, and how I can help uh, change kids' lives and, and save kids' lives. Uh, I have absolutely no doubt in my mind that it will. Um, it's already starting. Um, if there's anything that I can do or down the road to, um, you know, help you or, or promote it in any way that I can. I'm, I'm 100% for it. I will do anything and everything that I possibly can. Um, 
Brent, you're doing awesome things, man. Like keep it up. And uh, you have no idea how much I appreciate you coming on here. Um, you know, uh, getting to watch you play in Vancouver was, you know, you can say all you want that, you know, you're slow or whatever, but, um, you were a hell of a hockey player and I, you know, um, you know, you always had that long greasy flow. Um, no, 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 no. you know, sick flow. <laughs> it was pretty sick. It was pretty sick. What's your hair like right now? Is it short? Yeah, it's short. Somebody told me I had to grow up. So, um, you know, I cut it. I had my hair long for like 17 years. Cut it. And my my kids completely freaked freaked the fuck out. But um, yeah, that uh, that hair was uh, you know what I was known for. And you know, Vancouver you know was great. And we had some amazing teams. Is you know, Mark Snazlin, Todd Bertuzzi, uh, you know, Morrison line and Jovanovski, and you know, uh, Mark Messier was on uh, the ice for my first NHL goal. So um, some amazing times. Fans love to give it to me about my hair. And, you know, I used to get some fan mail, fan mail, you know, some, some fans would put some money in there, tell me to go cut my hair. Yeah. That's hilarious. I'll, yeah. On my, uh, I think on one of my, I think it was my third podcast, I told this story, but when I got traded to Kelowna, they already had three uh, overagers. So I was the fourth 20. Um, so we they had to get rid of one. And uh, Bruce Hamilton, the owner of the Kelowna Rockets basically said like, you know, like, I don't know, man, like whatever, because at the time, um, one of the twenties was a goalie, Chris Westbloom, who backstopped them to the wet, the Memorial cup, uh, as a 17 year old dropped by the Minnesota wild. Uh, the other one was their captain, um, a local Kelowna boy, James McEwen, who is the face of the class action lawsuit. I've had him on the podcast. Um, so he's not fucking going nowhere. And then the other one was Lion Messier, Mark Messier's son. And uh, Mark Messier was in the dressing room like two days before I got traded there, giving a speech to the team, whatever. And uh, I ended up beating out Mark Messier's kid and they cut him. So, um, you know, that's kind of, I honestly didn't think there was any chance that didn't matter what I fucking did in that position. I was like, there's no way they're cutting Mark Messier's kid. You know what I mean? But um, obviously, you know, he, it is what it is. Um, anyways, Brent, that's you know it's been over an hour um i would love it if you'd come on here and do this again like anytime sometime you know, anytime um you know one maybe once you know i i to be honest i just started really watching hockey again because it's been hard i'm mean, like oh i fought that guy I beat that guy up i scored on that guy i could think i'm faster than that guy mind you i haven't been on skates much in five years but you know how it is right um but now to the point now i'm at the point where it's like you know what um i'm okay with myself and i'm not like not jealous. Like I used to hate on Sidney Crosby because he's two weeks older than me, same birth year. And he's just so much better than me. Uh, not even just at hockey, but I realized he's just a better human being than me. So I, you know, I hated him for so long because I was jealous, but after a while and I grew up, I'm like, you know what? You have to love this guy. You have to respect this guy. Like he's great, you know? And uh, it, it's just funny how, how things change and we grow up and uh, you know, view the world differently, but I mean, it, it certainly hasn't been easy for, for me. I know it hasn't been easy for you, but, um, you know, uh, you're certainly doing things uh, that are wonderful, man, inspiring um, things. I know that's bringing purpose to you. And, and above all, that probably is the biggest thing, is it not? Like, um, I know doing things for other people is, is really the, that's my ultimate goal too. But I feel like to be able to get, to do the best for other people, I need to have, be able to bring out the best in myself. And uh uh, to be able to do that, to, to yeah. find meaning and purpose, you have to have that. And, um, you know, I'm so happy that you found that. I'm so happy that I found this outlet and that we've been able to connect, man. Um, you know, hopefully one day we can actually meet in person. If you ever come up to Canada or whatever, um, it'd be fucking great. But, uh, yeah, you know, you're, oh, you know, I'd love to have you back on. Like I said, um, you know, I'll be in touch with you and, um, yeah, I really appreciate it, man. Uh, you know, we're going to build a friendship and I'm here for you. Um, you know, uh, when you're in an airplane, they say your oxygen mass drops. And if you got a kid, you put it on yourself first because you got to be the best foundation uh, you know, for yourself, you know, for your girlfriend, for for your kids um, before you can start helping other people. And uh, there'll be a day when you have that foundation, you'll be able to uh, continue uh, giving back and spreading your wings. But, you know, what you're doing, you're, you're doing a great job. Um, this outreach, your podcast, being open and honest, um, you know, you're, you're, you're doing amazing things, saving lives, but you know, got a friendship. I've got your back and you know, we'll start, uh, you know, start building things uh, one day at a time. Awesome, Brent, man. I, I really appreciate it. And, uh, 
yeah, th there's no words, man. I, I, I truly appreciate it from the bottom of my heart. It really means the world to me. And, uh, I can't say enough about you. Just keep doing your thing, man. I, you're proud. I mean the world when you said you're proud of me, but just know that I'm proud of you. Be proud of yourself. Uh, you're doing fucking amazing things, man. So we'll talk soon. And thanks again. No problem. Take care. Okay. Thanks, Brent. Huge, huge thanks to former NHL defenseman and Stanley Cup champion Brent Sopel for stopping by, taking the time to talk to me today. It was really incredible. He really opened up. I can't thank him enough for uh, sharing his stories with me and just uh, being an inspiration to me and, and so many and just standing up for those with dyslexia. It's really incredible what he's doing, guys. So um, check out what he's doing. Uh, please be sure to check out teamissue.ca. Promo code TOEDRAG15 to get 15% off your total purchases. Um, guys, remember to follow at HockeyPodNet, uh, the Hockey Podcast Network. Uh, this is the new network that uh, this is the new home of Hockey to Heroin, the road to recovery. Um, they will have uh, all of my episodes on their network for the first 24 hours after they're released. So be sure to follow them, guys. And uh, stay tuned. I have some amazing guests coming up. I have Terry Ryan, Dale Weiss, Sheldon Kennedy, Chris Nylon, Dave Hunchak, my old coach, and of course, Gare Joyce, who has written this article that's coming out Tuesday morning on sportsnet.ca. So guys, thank you so much for listening. Stay tuned, guys, and please uh, leave me any feedback or any questions you may have, and uh, keep the comments and the support coming, guys. I love you so much.